you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, you can hear me. We didn't any check for a test for checking the sound. But um, 2022, a new year. Welcome, everyone. Uh, it's nice to see you all because you are recurrent participants from Linda's. It's a bit like a family, right? When we see each other for Linda's lectures. I did not expect to speak to you in these circumstances with uh, 2022 that starts with, again, another wave of actually a lot of fear and um, a lot of um, reconsidering what we will do with the center again. We were really on a good move. Uh, classes were happening, events were happening. We were having the uh, Youth Symphony Orchestra coming on, on Saturday or Friday. And uh, we were all elated and then this bomb falls again. So stay close to us, follow our newsletters, please do. I hope that you all receive our newsletter. If you don't, please go to our website, sebarts.org, sebarts.org and check out what's happening. Uh, we need your support more than ever. And we have received it from most of you. And thank you because participating in this lecture Thanks to Linda, who doesn't charge us anything for her wonderful lectures. You all support us in a really great way. So thank you for that. And uh, we can really use it. So, but follow our newsletter because we really want to know that, um, you know, you really need to know what's going to happen for the future. Different things will happen again. And more Zoom meetings, of course, for the weeks to come as well. So I hope that's clear. I also wanted to be here to introduce to you Paula Luna Sorrenti. Paula Luna is a new staff member and she is an administrative assistant. She actually first was hired to, to help Carolyn. And then when Carolyn left, she's taking on a lot of responsibilities together with another staff member called Shana. But Paula Luna is a wonderful professional person. She, uh, you, will, you, you probably have noticed already with exchanges with her, if you needed her, that she is fast in responding. And, uh, and, and like I said, very professional. She likes to do the things right, and we are very happy to have her. She will be uh, introducing Linda, and uh, I give the word to her. So thank you so much. Bye-bye. I just want to put in a plug for the show that's at the, gallery, at the Art Center now. It's so beautiful, our favorites show, and it's lovely. And uh, you'll enjoy it a lot if you don't, haven't been there yet. Uh, Lily, thank you for that. Yes, that's true. And I want to remind everyone that the gallery will stay open. We did a survey with our uh, gallery assistants and they are prepared to continue coming to the gallery, but we're open Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, four days in the week from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And uh, yes, so, and it's, it's really, even I say it's one of our best shows that we have had for a long time. The work is absolutely fantastic. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a show where everyone could come in and hang their own artwork. And it's really, really beautiful work. Really worth coming and having a look at it. Thank you. You're on mute, uh, Paula Luna. Hello, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Um, really excited to be working with Sebastopol Center for the Arts. Uh, a lot of really awesome programs that are going to be coming up this year. Um, and I'm just really happy to be here. So. Um, Thanks for welcoming me. Um, and so I'm just gonna give a little bit of a brief uh, introduction for Linda. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Linda Loveland Reed teaches art history for SSU and Dominican universities. She serves on our OLLI advisory board and curriculum committee and is chair of the OLLI art club with 200 members. Linda is a figurative and abstract painter. She has directed community theater for over 30 years and is author of two novels that are available on Amazon. Um, something Linda likes to say is you are what you art. <laughs> so um, I will let Linda go ahead and take it from here. We're really excited for your lecture today. Okay, great. I'm so glad to have everybody. And um, I'm going to be screen sharing here in just a minute, but I wanted to uh, welcome Paula and thank Catherine DeVriza always for um, ha having this show. And the Sebastopol Center for the Arts is just so all inclusive of the arts. We're so fortunate to have them in our county. They are, um, what they do is, is just amazing. And I really, really can't thank you all for your donations. It's so important. Um, the Q&A in terms of questions and answers, we're gonna wait till the end, 
for that. And I'd appreciate it if everyone would now mute yourselves, make sure that you're muted so that we don't pick up any telephones or dogs barking. Thank you. And I'm going to screen share right now. So. Is that coming through okay? And do you just see my screen and you don't see my notes? Catherine? No, you need to go a little bit larger like you did the first time. Oh, okay. All right, I'm gonna do it again then, sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna do advanced. While Linda is doing that, I want to remind you also that Linda is on our board. She's our secretary of the board at Sebastian Center for the Arts. <laughs> and here we are, Linda, now we have the right screen. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, so today what we're gonna do is look at conceptual art. And so, uh, so bottom line, what is conceptual art? Here it is, this is conceptual art. All right, just a minute, I have to get my... So this is conceptual art, and this is artist um, John Baldessari. And um, so for, for, for one thing, conceptual art is the mind over the eye. Now that's something very different from what we've had with art that is just a beautiful landscape. Uh, but it's not a, this is not a window. It's not a landscape that you might just kind of think of yourself as walking into the painting and you don't, you, you aren't not able so much to do that with conceptual art. And it, it rejects for the most part, a lot of it, the, the traditional idea of putting a canvas on an easel and painting it. And it's, it's really not so much about craftsmanship as it is more about idea. So those are some kind of tenets of conceptual art. Uh, John Baldessari, uh, he is always called the gentle giant. Uh, he, he was uh, 6.7 uh, feet tall and he has thousands of works around the world. And he's a distinguished instructor at, uh, instructor at Cal Arts in LA. And this is a very um, uh, prestigious and a recognized school for this kind of art. Now, um, uh, so what John Baldessari said is he pushed back against what was the trend at the time was abstract expressionist. So this comes after that and he pushes back against that. And he, he says, I will not make any more boring art. So what he does in 1970, he burns up all of his abstract art and then he takes the ashes and he puts them in a cookie jar and then he boards them up behind a wall in his home and then he puts an article in the newspaper and he says i cremated my work so he made a art piece he made a conceptual art piece out of the cremation of his abstract work and he paints now paints uh, paintings like this. If you see these two circles here in front of faces, that is going to be uh, a quintessential uh, John Baldessari work. This is called Two High Rises and Two Witnesses. So um, it, it's sort of a sign signature motif. Now, what is being said here? Well, we have at the top, we have maybe every woman uh, and she's been out shopping. We have every man and he's in his business suit. And then we have this high rises, which are erupting. So is it a comment on society's absorption with commerce and money, perhaps? Well, this is definitely conceptual art. This is Bruce Nauman, and he is considered one of the most creative artists working today. He was an assistant to Wayne Tebow. He taught at the San Francisco Art Institute, and he's our guy. He's, uh, he's uh, studio was in Mission District in San Francisco in Mill Valley. I don't think that's the case anymore. He's wildly, worldly famous. Um, one day he confronted, he, he, he was a, a new artist. He had finished school. He's sitting in his studio, and he said, you know, what to do? So then he said, well, 
I'm an artist and I'm sitting in my studio. And so whatever I'm doing in the studio must be art. And here we have him using his body to produce a fountain. And this is a very iconic work of conceptual art, period. Here's another of, um, of Bruce Nauman's works. We are at the Geyserville, in Geyserville at the Oliver Ranch, owned by Steve and Nancy Oliver. Have you been there? Have you toured it? If you haven't, you might really want to do that because the property is full of pieces by very famous sculptures. Um, what Steve and Nancy Oliver do is they invite the artist and then the artist, they get to pick their location on the ranch and they can take however long time they want to do their piece. There's one artist that took 11 years before she did her piece and then the piece is permanently installed. So to have it permanently and forever someplace is really something special for that artist. So um, have, have you walked down these stairs at Oliver's Ranch? These were done by Bruce Nauman. They're a quarter of a mile. There's 289 steps and each step is a different height. So it's a little bit dicey to do it. I've done it and it was great fun. So these are the irascible 18 and we're going to step back now and see what the art was before conceptual art. And that was, of course, modern art. And, you know, the modern art, we can look back to like 1863 and we can look at Manet and that's sort of the beginning of modern art. And then, of course, we, we get our World War I and World War II when so many European artists who were doing more modern work came to the United States. And when they did, they brought this influence with them to the American artists and the whole art uh, center shifted from Paris at that time to America uh, because, uh, because of so many artists coming here. So this photo is of 18 New York artists called the New York School, and they are all doing abstract expressionism. And we have right in the center here, your brooding Pollock. There's Rothko and de Kooning. And um, they fought, all of these fought the traditional style and they eventually won. So Robert Motherwell, he was the intellectual leader of the abstract expressionist movement. He grew up in San Francisco. He had his BA in philosophy at Stanford and he abandoned a PhD at Harvard because he just, he just barreled right into art. And he was thought to be rich by his colleagues of the time because he received the sumptuous sum of 50 bucks a week from a trust fund. So that, that seemed like a lot of money in those days. So we are looking one, at one of his Spanish elegies. Over a period of 40 years, he painted 170 of these same subjects. Oh my gosh, I've seen them and I've seen a few of them in a collection and they're just so exciting. I don't know, do you like this? I love it. There's just, so, there's just an, a power um, here and energy that I find ex very exciting. So these elegies are based on the poet Lorca who was murdered by national forces at the beginning of the Spanish-American uh, War. In 1951, Motherwell uh, writes a book called Modern Artists in America. And at the time, it's the most extensive book on modern, modern art today. So he, he was definitely one of the leaders of that. Here we have Helen Frankenthaler, and she's sitting amongst her stain paintings. Now we call these stain paintings because what she does is she thins down her paint, puts it on the canvas, so the canvas absorbs the paint. Now what she, what she accomplishes with this is she gets a flat surface. Flat was very important at that time. Why? Well, it was a theory that brush strokes carry the weight of an artist's hand and that can influence you, the viewer. So if you can't see that brush stroke, then you are going to not be led into 
your concept of the painting, but you'll have your own concept. So she came from a wealthy family. She was 22 and she went head to head with the men. And eventually later, she actually married Robert Motherwell. Now this is Mark Rothko and we call his paintings color field because they're just like colors of field and they're not complicated uh, with other colors. He wanted his work to embody human emotions, even tragedy. And, and to some people it did. Tom Wolf wrote a book that is, I, I recommend to you, it's a very short book, but it's a lot of fun. It's called The Painted Word. It's funny, it's scathing, but it's very informative also about abstract work. And what he said was, after going to hundreds of openings in New York, and leaning close in and then out and then looking, looking, looking really close and waiting. And then, my God, he figured it out. Without the theory, you cannot see the painting. So the theory had become all important. It was how to make the whole work of the object and not just one thing in the painting like a flower, but you, the viewer, see the entire painting uh, as a whole and how the viewer engages flat versus painterly, etc. Here we have Joan Mitchell and uh, she was one of the few women who did uh, uh, gain fame among the New York artists. She was born in Chicago. Joan Mitchell was wealthy and she was well connected which probably allowed her to be a little difficult. She was sharp-tongued, dealt with some alcoholism. Did you see her recent retrospective at MoMA? Might still be up. Uh, I did. It was a knockout. I was just mesmerized for the whole thing. I love her work. There's just um, so much energy and actually emotion in her work. Um, so she went to Smith's College and the Art Institute of Chicago, and she took a class from the most famous modern art instructor of the time, which was Hans Hoffman. And in fact, he might be um, still considered uh, the most famous modern art instructor. And she said, Joan Mitchell said, I couldn't understand one word he said, so I left, terrified. In 1952, she marries a young market analysis who we know as Alan Greenspan, the former Fed Reserve Board Chair. And um, late, later, it's kind of a, a little tidbit, later Greenspan marries Andrea Mitchell, who is of course a, a, a news pundit. Um, and uh, I guess he just likes the last name Mitchell. So here's another one of Mitchell's. I took this um, at, the, at, the, at the MoMA exhibit and you can see that some of her paintings get very, very large. I just think they're very exciting. This one is one that she does based on Van Gogh's wheat field with crows. You can just see, you can see the wheat, you can see these crows flying above, you know, um, it, 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 it was sort of a symbol of death and suicide and darkness. And her, it was her sense that Van Gogh had painted this, this his painting of the wheat fields with Crow as a suicide note. And Joan Mitchell died in 1992 at age 66 from lung cancer. Uh, she was a, um, um, an avid smoker. Okay, so um, we know the most famous abstract expressionist is Jackson Pollock. And here he is shown with his wife and painter, Lee Krasner. So what happened to abstract expressionism? We know they struggled and they had all these angst and nobody bought their paintings and on and on. Well, that happened for about five or six years, but after that, it began to take off and people did begin to buy this. In fact, you know, some artists had become wealthy uh, and and start in in the starting with the Met's purchase of Pollock's Autumn Rhythm in 1957 for thirty thousand. Now Pollock died in 1956, and the abstract movement, abstract expressionist movement, became the tradition. 
And of course, if it's tradition, it smells like Academy. And that means that all the new artists are going to want something different. And so we get works by Robert Rauschenberg. This um, was, you know, everyone just got tired of abstract expressionists. They got tired of the, you know, they got tired of the um, theory and the new artists, artists just didn't want to have all this angst in their personal souls buried and, and they didn't want analysis and automatism and all these kinds of things that had come along with abstract expressionism. And Robert Rauschenberg was leading the attack, if you will, against abstract expressionists. He and his partner, Jasper Johns, wanted art that represented today, the people that didn't, that didn't need theory, any theory to understand it, or didn't need to know the artist's bio to understand it. So here we have bed. This is an assemblage that's done by Robert Rauschenberg and it is found everyday objects is his actual bed and pillow and blanket. Um, and um, so, oh, and I, on February 9th, I'm going to do a lecture on Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper John. So I hope you'll join me for that. This is a wonderful piece. Um, I saw this at the um, LA uh, County uh, Modern Art Museum, and it's it's very funny. It's very contemporary, and um, this is Edward Kinholz, and he was a raging satirist. It's called Backseat Dodge 1938, and um, you can see there's kind of empty beer bottles, and she, they're in the back seat together, and her dress is above her knees, and uh, it was rather shocking. The LO, LA County supervisors said it's revolting, it's pornographic, and it's blasphemous. Well, they threatened to withhold financing from the museum unless they removed this piece from view. So the upshot with that is that the car door would remain, the, the piece would remain in the gallery, but the car door would remain closed with a gallery guard nearby to be opened on request if you were over 18. And on opening day, there were 200 people lined up to have the door opened. And it's kind of a little extra tidbit that King Holtz ends up marrying the chief of police daughter well, this is for sure, um, this is for sure conceptual art. This is Andy Warhol. And um, so many, um, even artists were appalled when he first showed this, this art, Brillo. Um, and they called it kitsch, they, you know, which is something familiar and um, rather lowbrow. Uh, it was prone to, you know, was involved with advertising. Um, and, and it was, of course, we call it pop art. And the reason is that it, it, it's work about popular everyday things. Um, so there was no difference between Warhol's boxes that he did in 1964 and those in the store. It was, they, his were made of wood but you couldn't tell. So then the big discussion, well, was art dead? Was this the end of art history? He had turned a commodity into an icon. So why was this happening? Well, there was tech advances, computerized automation. We had mass communication, TV advertised an abundance of commodities and people had good jobs and they could afford to buy things. So the, the whole United States was moving towards commercialism. This is Elvis 1964 by Andy Warhol. Do you like this? I love Andy Warhol's work. I think that the way that he took and put these, these famous um, people on silk screens uh, and then he has a way of manipulating the image. I just think they're, they're wonderful. So Andy Warhol, he might be the most important art, well, the most 
I don't know if he's the most important, but he's certainly a very well-known artist. People know Andy Warhol's name, whether they know his art or not. He made a career of originally denying originality by borrowing from the familiar. He made them originally his own, which was very original. He was um, a graphic designer and he was successful in that, but he left that and moved over towards art. So the problem with pop art was that it, it did have that blending of commodity. Now, this one is he did, uh, this sold in 2008, not this particular one, but you know, he has three Elvises, I think he has six Elvises, uh, eight Elvises sold for just a mere 100 million. So this is another Warhol. Now, Andy Warhol did a series of of dour um, photos that he silk screened. And um, he did a, a whole series on electric chairs. He also did nasty accidents. And it's the dark side and people ask why. I mean, if you look at all the rest of his work, flowers and, and, and just, and a lot of beauty, why did he go towards this as well? And um, his father, many assume that his father had died in an accident when Andy was just 13. But Andy Warhol said, he, ex he explained this very simply. He said, quote, it's just things, things people like to look at. Well, I guess we do sort of look when we're passing an accident on the freeway. So, um, uh, of course, there is the shock factor, and Andy Warhol liked that as well. <clears throat> this is Warhol's Marilyn. I just love this. Of course, I was crazy about Marilyn Monroe. So th there were many uh, weird hanger honors who populated Warhol's life, but really he was the only original. He was, <clears throat> many thought, a genius. He, his, he, his ma he mass produced his work with helpers. Now this was a new idea. Uh, you know, art was thought to be from the hand of the artist. And here we are having him <clears throat> with these people helping him. So wasn't an art piece supposed to be just that, if it's just from the artist and not from a, a, a group of people or directed by the artist. So folks didn't seem to mind. They loved th this work by Andy Warhol, for instance. And here's where he did his work and lived. It's called The Factory. It is covered in silver. Everything is painted silver or covered in silver foil. And in 1963, you might remember a disgruntled fan entered the factory and shot Andy two times, once through the lungs. She shot another man two times and she was going to shoot a third man and pointed the gun at him, only the gun jammed. Can you just imagine that? So no one died, miraculously. <clears throat> she got three years and he did die in 1987 of complications followed by just a routine gallbladder surgery. <clears throat> and then we have Roy Lichtenstein and this is pop art. So pop art was a cool put down to abstract expressionism. Why? Because abstract expressionism by the general population was thought to be sort of elitist. In other words, the general public <clears throat> didn't get it when they looked at one of those paintings. You had to be sort of an insider, an artist, or maybe a dealer or collector. You certainly had to know the theory. Pop art was easy. It was familiar. It became the first movement in modern art to win immediate acceptance. Well, maybe not immediate, but very quick acceptance from the public. People missed seeing images that they, uh, that they recognized. So um, uh, the positive side of pop art, of course, is that it's nostalgic. I mean, it brings, it, it's familiar. So the negative side, of course, which you've talked about is that it's so, it can be so easily identified with the commercial world. This is another Roy Lichtenstein. Now what he does here, is he has loaded this brush and he's made these marks and it's called um, Little Big Painting. 
and he's made gestural brush strokes. And this is a bash against abstract expressionism and all of their theory and all of their in, in, importance. So we move into a different kind of conceptual art in that this is, um, the, again, a rejection of the commercialism that had come in through pop art. And this is something called a happening. Alan Capro was uh, considered the father of happenings. And uh, so, um, uh, yes, yes, what these are, these are students and they are licking jam off of Volkswagen. So the question is what Capro said is if the artist was in hell in 1946 as an abstract expressionist trying to make it, now he was in business and he didn't like that because they had become successful. So Capro was an art historian and a painter and he wanted to get people to feel, not just look and buy. And yes, again, these are these these are students, and they are in a happening that um, Alan uh, Capro put together. So it was an event that included the girl students, and they were nesting, and the males were protecting, and it sort of broke down into a, a big fight. Uh, you sort of had to be there. This is Chris Burden. So in the 70s, we saw the rise of the NRA and the news, Vietnam was all around us. Um, Chris Burden, uh, he stood 15 feet from a shooter who shot him with a 22 rifle while he was being videoed. You can see it on YouTube, it's rather tense. Later, and then of course he had pictures taken and he sold the pictures and so on. So it was an art piece. So a student uh, later, Burden himself was a professor at UCLA and a student came into his classroom waving a gun around and then ran out in the hall, fired a shot in the hall and threw himself against the wall. And Burden and of course everyone in the classroom thought that the kid had shot himself. So it was a performance piece that the art student did now, Burden wanted to get the kid expelled because he thought it was real and it scared him. Burden resigned because he said it could have been real. Well, artists change, and this is also Chris Burden, and it is a beautiful thing. These are um, old antique um, street lights that uh, he uh, erected. So this is an example of the art world changing. It's embracing all sorts of work. Um, and this is shown outside the LA County, a modern art building. And it's 202 old, beautiful street lights and they're rigged for solar power. So I've seen good and bad reviews of this, but it seems quite exquisite to me. So this is Yoko Ono the wife of the Beatle, John Lennon. And this is performance art. And performance art is done in real time. It's immediate, it's intimate. No one knows, not even the artist, what's actually going to happen. So here, uh, Yoko was an artist, you know, way before she met John. And, um, She's very popular today, but she, of course, she struggled for her own voice for many years. So in, this is called cut piece and Yoko sits pass, passively on stage and she invites the audience to cut her clothes away. Now, why does she do this? What is this about? So it's 1964. She's commenting on the Japanese women as passive with little power and the whole challenge of submissiveness. So why was art restless and changing? With the 60s and the 70s in America, events affected our, all of our lives. You know, change fosters change. Rocking boats cause water to splash everywhere. And finally you're sinking and swimming. 
So we have civil rights movement, Woodstock Festival, Cold War with the Soviet Union. Oh my gosh, do you remember hiding under your desk? The Berlin Wall, Cuban Missile, Space Race, um, Vietnam War, assassinations of Robert and John Kennedy and Martin Luther King, race riots, um, Kent State shooting, which was terrible, Watergate and Nixon's resignation, um, <clears throat> and the Iran hostage issue. So those were tough times. I, it's kind of interesting, isn't it, to put that all together and think about those tough times. We seem to be facing a lot of tough times right now. Okay, <clears throat> so while all this newness is happening, just a minute, I'm gonna take a sip of water. While, while I'm sorry, Ooh. while all this newness is happening, uh, let's remember that the mass audience is not embracing this new art. Okay, the high art, you know, we have our curators and our collectors and they kind of set the pace, but you know, they're way out there in front. The, the general population did, was not embracing this new art. And yes, they understood pop, but that doesn't mean that the pop was the first choice for their own living room walls. What was? Well, Walter King was the best selling artist in the Bay Area during the 50s and the 60s. Do you remember his work? I always loved it. So he was a flamboyant member of the North Beach scene, and he painted these wide-eyed waifs, dogs, everything, wide-eyed. Um, I, I thought they were charming. Of course, the art world called them kitsch, something familiar and of lower art. They're darling. So... This was, uh, the wife was also pa a painter. And the question became, was the wife the actual artist? So here's Margaret, Margaret Keene's painting of Joan Crawford. And Herb Kane, who knew both of them, said that Margaret was the actual artist. Margaret lives in the Napa area and she once lived in Sebastopol. And if you have a Keene, it goes from 1,000 to 6,000. Now, you might have seen the movie called Big Eyes, which is about the Kings. Walter and Margaret ended up in uh, a decades long court battle. It even went to federal court. And at the jury trial, Margaret challenged her husband to a paint off, whereby she whipped up a painting in a few minutes and Walter said, his shoulder hurt. The court sided with Margaret and she was able to market the work under her own name. And here we have Wayne Tebow. So Wayne Tebow um, is a very famous California pop art painter. And he taught at UC Davis for many, many decades. And he just died in December. He was 101 years old. He's called the hungriest artist in California. And we know why. Because he painted cakes and pies and bubble gum. Have you ever seen his work? Um, his pies and his cakes, they are amazing. I mean, they are just uh, thick and pasto wonderful they just resonate off the off the canvas his work is wonderfully ungimmicky he's and he's more classical in style than he is even in pop and he began as an art uh, as a cartoonist by the way he wanted to paint he said like William de Kooning but he didn't have the fire well we're just happy that he painted the way he painted because we've enjoyed his work and will for many years this is another Wayne Tebow. He taught his students that hard work is a supplement to creativity. And his focus was on the realistic subjects. He did, he, he, this did not, by the way, endear him to the high art world. It, it kept him from being touted, really, uh, and given 
the due that he should have received. But now, of course, he's considered one of America's great painters. His uh, his uh, a desert pa- his dessert paintings sell for about oh four or five million. A painting like this probably sells for one million. <clears throat> oh, and I just wanted to point out too that he did a lot of landscape, the uh, San Francisco landscapes, and they're really just they're really just terrific. So Pop was here to stay. It changed the world forever, and. We have here a David Hockney. You probably knew that already. Uh, He was born in England, but he lived in California for 30 years. And both the Brits and California claim, claim him as a pop artist. And Britain today considers him the most influenced artist of the 20th century. And did you see his huge exhibit at the de Young? Oh my gosh, it was just thrilling. Um, so this painting and other paintings that are sometimes referred to as splash paintings are among his famous from his California days. They're flat, uh, they're almost advertisement looking. And in, in November of 2018, this 1972 painting portrait of an artist sold for 90 million, which was the most expensive work by an artist at an auction. So this is Hockney, um, and he has now returned to England and he lives in East, East Yorkshire. And his subject seems to be about the outdoors now. And he uses a brush, but he also does a lot of digital painting. And he he works on his iPad or his iPhone. Hockney's reinvention of himself as a landscape artist is both loved and doubted. There are people, one critic wrote about his iPad drawings that openness to technical innovation is one thing, but art is another. Well, may, maybe so, but they're pretty wonderful. His work is flat. His brush strokes are not seen that much. He's kind of like Grandma Moses on steroids. But it's never easy to forge new ideas. Landscape is a very traditional in scope. And so, of course, he's going to get pushed back. <clears throat> well, we get into a, conce- a concept of... Um, of minimalism. So the abstract expressional gestural art became cliche. They wanted more and they wanted, it was about shape and mass and size and color. And what came out of all of this was minimalism. This is Barnett Newman and it's called One Minute. And it sold to Microsoft's Paul Allen uh, in 2013 for 43 million, almost 44. It's about, this art is about the purity of the art piece in relationship to the viewer. Other critics compared the zip. Now this is a zip. This is what this line going down the center of Newman's paintings is called a zip. And, there were, there were critics who compared this zip to God's primal act of creation, to the division of light from darkness, to the future of Adam, to passages in the Kabbalah. It's a seminal piece for Newman. He, he, hand, hand, he hand drew the strip down the center, and you can see that. It's painterly. Painterly is when we can really see that brush stroke, which is my favorite kind of work. And so he, he drew this down the center. Now he, he had drawn the line and then intended to paint both sides, but he looked at it and he left it and he looked again and kept looking at it. And in fact, he looked at this painting for, for eight months and he wondered why it moved him. And finally he understood the painting was completely me, he said. So the line, the line is, called many things. The line doesn't divide the painting, but it unites it. It brings it to life. By reducing the composition to nothing, he had killed the preciousness of painting as an art object 
and force the viewer to see it as an idea. Okay, as an idea. This is another one of Barnett Newman's and um, it's huge. It's seven by 18 feet. It refers to man as upright creature above the slinking crawly thing. Man is heroically sentient with consciousness and therefore man is sublime. When standing close, you can feel engulfed by this. It evokes emotions by being overwhelmed by an infinite universal landscape. These are various things that people have said about this painting. Obviously it's color field, isn't it? Because it's all a color field. Um, the texture is very, very flat. And the two zips are now done with tape instead of being hand done, which I don't like as much. It's being done by tape to further remove the artist from the painting so that when you, the viewer, look at it, you have less influence. So Newman said, if read properly, it means the end of all state capitalism and totalitarianism. And the famous art critic, Robert Hughes said, bullshit, <laughs> sorry. Um, now, this is Donald Judd, and I'm sure that you have seen this. Th this, of course, is minimalism, and he is a famous minimalist, and these are called stacks. And I can tell you that every modern museum in America wants one of these. The highest price that's been paid for, the, for one of these is $6 million. And I know that you have seen it if you've been in the Modern Art Museum. So Judd served in the Army as an engineer, and he was an art critic for magazines, and he taught at Yale. So these, these are iconic minimalist pieces. Now, this is Judd's um, Marfa. This is at Marfa, Texas. He has a large 340-acre ranch, I guess. Um, and he puts his minimalist artwork there. And um, what you're looking at are 100 aluminum boxes in specially designed housing with these huge windows. Each box is exactly 41 by 51 by 72 inches. And the boxes were not built by Judd. They were designed by Judd and they were ordered up by Judd. So again, the idea of the artist's hand being more removed. Now, this all probably sounds silly or wasteful or why, why do we even do this? But if you can just put all that aside, just imagine yourself walking around this building, the light flooding in on the highly polished floors and the 100 silver boxes. There's nothing else in the building. This is an artistic experience. This is a happening. You are amazed. They are beautiful. Who would do this? If you can get past, this is really just a stupid box and I'm not falling for it and let yourself relax. You could enjoy um, maybe something that you had not expected. I don't mean to make that sound like a lecture. You are totally entitled to think this is wasteful and silly. I'm just giving you an option. Okay, so art had come to a place where the question was, does art need even to be about an object or anything? What if it is just a written explanation of the art piece? John Baldessari did that. So, what is painting, he wrote. Do you sense how all the parts of a good picture are involved with each other, not just placed side by side? Art is a creation for the eye and can only be hinted at with words. So, our art journey to date has seen traditional painting has been reduced. There's no more a window on the world. There's not people, there's no flowers, there's not landscape. It's changed from objective to subjective, to thin, to flat, 
to not touched by the artist. So where can we go from this? Was art dead? Well, of course not. Never. Everything that has ever been done is still being created. And that's wonderful. All of the isms, they're still out there being done and more. This is Jennifer Bartlett. Boats uh, is a nine by 14 foot. What should, what should I call this? What would you call it? The boats are on the outside, a sculpture. The painting is on the wall. Is it a painting? Is it a sculpture? How do we, how do we talk about this kind of art? Well, how do we talk about this kind of art? So we have uh, uh, 10, in this, in this world, there are 10,000 museums, uh, art institutions. We have public collections worldwide, 117 commercial galleries. We have 500 auction houses. There's over almost 300 art fairs. What we have here is Damien Hurst is a sample of new artists today, entrepreneur and full of drama. So Damien Hurst was part of the young British artists and the, the artists in the art world in, in Britain today is uh, giving America a run for its money. This is a 13 foot tiger shark in formaldehyde in a vitrine tank, two tons. So the name of this is the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. Well, now if Damien Hurst had just named it shark, you might have just moved right on by and not paid any attention. In one of his artworks, <clears throat> I will tell you, and there are more than the, one of these, a fin fell off the fish. Now the question is, if you replace the fish, does it reduce the value? And the, the famous um, uh, art dealer, Larry Gagosian, he says, no, this is conceptual art. The rules change. So there's the name of this, of this fish. So Damien Hurst, here he is with his boys. He's called the Hooligan Artist. Uh, he hit the scene in the 90s and he was outraging traditionalism and becoming the superstar of conceptual art. He attended Ghost, Goldsmiths University in London and um, he studied um, designs, uh, psychiatry, drama, and music. And Charles Saatchi, which is one of the world's most influential collectors, put up $70,000 to assist Hurst in developing his shark idea. And the headlines in uh, England uh, on the shark when it was presented said $70,000 for fish with no chips. <laughs> Okay, so here's his home, uh, kind of a nice little place. Uh, he's unmarried to, um, he was, that is, un, uh, unmarried, lived with his partner, uh, Mia Norman, and she was a California gal, and, and she is the mother of their three children, and she knew Hearst way before he was the world's richest living artist. And she was happy to party alongside him. And they were together for years in what was thought to be a very stable relationship. And the, um, the, they had a lot of wonderful parties. Everybody loved him. Hearst says of himself, I got sick of myself. He retired to a quiet family life in this 300-year-old farmhouse. And uh, friends were shocked when she eventually left him. So goes the life of the rich and the famous. But I do want to show you Hearst's uh, first piece, uh, big piece, and how he got started. As I said, uh, he was at Goldsmith University uh, with this installation piece called A Thousand Years. <clears throat> it's a 20-foot vitrine. It's got a rotting head of a cow, and um, it... Uh, uh, so here was the cow's head when it started, but um, maggots hatched flies 
and eventually uh, diminishing the head. Um, so, but, but this occurs slowly so that folks can visit again in several days to see the cow's head getting smaller and the pile of flies, dead flies getting bigger. Well, I'm not gonna ask you what you think of this one. So here's a happier piece that Dam Damien Hurst does. And um, he, he does just a total variety of things and, and so they're quite different. This is called spot painting. Uh, he has over 1400 of these spot paintings and they go for about a million bucks a piece. Um, he has six studios and 160 assistants. Um, and Jerry Saltz, who is a art critic, said that Hearst is now turning out exhibitionist schlock, but has done great things. Once you put a 13 foot shark in formaldehyde, it's hard to keep going upward. But he has kept going upward. And here is his skull called for the love of God. It's a human skull. It's 18th century real human skull. It's encrusted with 8,601 flawless diamonds. And there's a pear shaped, pear shaped diamond in the forehead. And the teeth were purchased by Hearst from 18th century as well. So the name of this is for the love of God and the skull proclaims victory over decay and represents death. So why the name? Why is it called for the love of God? And that's because Damien Hurst's mother said, for the love of God, Damien, what are you going to do next? Well, this is what he did. $21 million to produce this and it sold for 100 million. That was quite a while ago. I'm sure it sold for a lot more. And yes, there are other skulls. This isn't the only one. Okay, so this is a Damien Hurst art piece. This is a called Pharmacy. This is an art installation. Each one of these shelves will sell for lots of money. In 2008, Hurst did something that stopped the art world cold. He cons consigned directly to an auction house. Uh, Sotheby's. This is this had never been done before. It was very risky because he was cutting out his dealers who were very famous dealers. And he delivered them 200 pieces to be sold at auction. They sold out for 100 million. And, and so it, th this was astounding because an artist had never gone directly like this to an auction house before. Here he is. Um, he's standing uh, in front of his butterfly sculptures, he raises these butterflies and as they pass away, he makes uh, art out of them. So he does jewelry and clothing, painting, sculptures, t-shirts, spin paintings. Um, so in 2008, of course, art was also part of the bubble. And so everything stopped cold for a year, but the prices of course are soaring again. This is the last piece I'm gonna show you by Damien Hurst. And you, you can see why I'm using him because he's so diverse. Um, so this is called Miraculous Journey. So let's, let's set the stage. It's a dark and steamy hot night. The amplified sound of a baby's heart throb pierces through the air, beat, beat, beat. Purple lights illuminate 14 massive bronze sculptures, each between nine and 28 tons, wrapped in white silk cloth. The beats, beat, beat stops. The cloth drops away and 14 statues are on display ending with the 46 foot tall anatomically correct baby boy. It is charting the gestation of a fetus from conception to birth. Where are we? We are in Qatar, a peninsula in the Persian Gulf. 
and this was commissioned in 2013 by the royal family of Qatar. So in Qatar, women adhere to the old Islamic traditions. They wear the abaya, they cover their faces, the images of women are censored in books and magazines. But the world is involved with art today. Every country, there are, as I said, 10,000 museums. They want this art to fill their new museums and to attract us to visitors. And now we're going to look at our next artist, which is Jeff Koons. And again, Jeff Koons um, is an entrepreneur. Buyers are attracted to the wow factor. Jeff Koons, here he is with Michael Jackson and Bubbles. Wow. So art is used, used to be, it used to be that it embodied something meaningful and it, uh, enough to be relevant beyond the time in which it was made. You, it, it used to have to maybe be around for a long time before it was taken serious. Maybe the artist even had to die before it was taken serious. But today's collectors want art that holds up a mirror to daily life. They buy it fresh out of the oven. One critic said that Kuhn's works was about class struggle. And critic Robert Q said, if Jeff Kuhn's work is about class struggle, that I'm Maria of Romania. <laughs> the reason that they're buying this art uh, uh, hot off the press, so to speak, is because it's the art they can buy. If you have a million dollars and you wanna buy something, uh, you're not gonna buy a, a, an old master for a million dollars. Number one, they're in collections or they're in museums. They rarely come up for sale, even even impressionist work, all of that, again, the same thing. And, and if they do come up for sale, it ain't for 1 million. So if you wanna buy some art, this is what you're gonna buy. So um, now we're gonna look at another Jeff Koons. So auctions are high society. And they're like a spectator support today. People arrive in limos to kiss the air and to be seen. This is Jeff Kuhn's art piece. Yes, you might think they're just Hoover vacuums in a vitrine cases. And they are. At auction, there is a catalog that it lists the items and in there it explains the item, it gives a description, it talks a little bit about the artist, bio and so on. But when the piece comes up from auction, you don't get any of that. You will have already looked at that. When the piece comes up for auction, you only get this, Coons, lot 10. And the hammer drops 76, 70 seconds later and another Hoover sales for 11 million. This is also a Jeff Koons, a seated ballerina. Uh, and um, hit, most of his work is really very lovely um, and, and, and pretty. Um, and, and this is at the Rockefeller Center. It's inflatable nylon and it's 45 feet. And Kuhn's net worth is about 500 million. I'm sure it's a lot more today too. That. Now, um, so Kuhn's marries, he gets married. And the, the, this is Kuhn's. This is actually Kuhn's. It's a painting. And that's actually his wife. He marries Ilona Stoller in 1991. And she is an Hungarian porno star and member of the Italian parliament. Wait a minute. Pono Star Italian Parliament. That works. Okay, so Coons did sculpture and videos and paintings depicting them in a variety of love making positions. And I'm not showing you a lot of that because it is way phonographic. This right here is a huge painting, and he fills a room with this pornography basically and shows it to the general population. Now, 
Unfortunately, they get a divorce and she takes their son to Italy. So goes the life of the rich and famous. Oops, for some reason I'm not advancing. There you go. Okay, so this is enough. Je another Jeff Koons. As I told you, his his work is is usually when it's not phonographic, um, it really very uh, cheerful and happy and um, and fun. So Jeff Koons is like Hearst. He, he's a business artist, and these these are stainless steel balloon sculptures. And his um, this piece is in the Louvre in Paris. And his, his steel, his balloon steel art sculptures sell from 30 to 60 million. So they're like Warhol soup cans. And Kuhn's changes the character of the daily item, like a vacuum and animal shapes into art. This is Ai Weiwei, and he was born in 1947. And these are sunflower seeds. This is called sunflower seeds, and it's a Tate Modern. <clears throat> so you might think that those are people standing and sitting on sand. Uh, not, not sand. They're on sunflower seeds. And he's a political act activist, and he's critical of China, the Chinese government's stance on democracy and human rights. And he has done many, many, many works. Uh, you can look him up and they're all very interesting. And he, if you remember the bird nest at the Beijing in the 2008 Olympics, he was one of the consultants on the design of that bird nest. So amazing, people are just laying their barefoot. They're loving the idea. They're feeling the experience. Here it is a little bit close up. What we have here are five tons of porcelain sunflower seeds. There's 100 million seeds. And when you look at the whole, you can see this dull landscape, but when you pick up a seed, you can see each has been individually sculpted and painted with different designs. People um, put them in their mouth. They, they, they don't know, they, 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 they wanna test them. They don't even believe that they're porcelain. So what was his point? Well, he's referencing the vast Chinese population, reminding government that they are not a single mass, that, that, can, that, that people uh, can be thoughtlessly trampled on, but each a person with their own hopes and needs. So do you like this? This is by Jean-Michel Basquiat. I love it. There's energy, there's color. The subject is very complex, but just, just the design of it. I mean, I could have that hanging on my wall and just see something different in it all the time. So Basquiat, this is called Philistines, and he is considered the contemporary neo-expressionist painter of the 80s. And he was a young man. He talked his way into the art world with charm and with talent. He had a girlfriend who was an unknown singer. Her name was Madonna. And he'd had a very tough childhood. And he died of an overdose at age 28. And um, he was at the peak of his career. And here he is, Basquiat, sitting next to Andy Warhol in front of one of Basquiat's paintings. Again, I just love these paintings. They're just, they're, they're, they're just cover, colorful, they're emotional, um, they're, they're creative. <clears throat> so Andy Warhol liked Basquiat's work and they became very good friends. And um, his, his work fo focuses on dichotomies, you know, the wealth versus poverty, integration versus segregation. He attacked power structures and racism. And unfortunately, he became very depressed. Andy Warhol, when Andy Warhol died very unexpectedly of this gallbladder operation, um, then Basquiat became very, very, very depressed. He isolated himself and then he died in 1988 of a, hor 
of a hormone overdose. Every modern art gallery in the world must have a Basquiat. So here's a conceptional piece, um, a sad piece. It's done by Ed Keenholz, the one who did the funny uh, blue Ford backseat car. Um, so we see a man on the bottom rack and um, he's strapped to his bed. And what makes this so wrenching is the artist Ed Keenholz worked in a mental hospital and he drew from real life experience. So the man so beaten down and dehumanized that he can't even dream. And when he dreams, here's his dream. He can only have his thoughts of his current horrible existence. What a piece. So here's a really fun piece, Kate Gilmore's Through the Claw. It's a happening. It's a live performance at Pace Gallery in New York. It took place. There are 7,500 pounds of clay. And of course, these women. Gilmore works with the area of women struggling to overcome self-imposed obstacles. So here we are with the clay, 7,500 pounds, and they are clawing it away. Takes them 2.5 hours to remove the clay from the center clump and throw them against the wall. And here is the final piece. So people remarked on the ferociousness that overtook the women as they worked as a team uh, to get this clay down. Um, and lots of things have been read into it. Is it fecal-like quality of the clay and so on and so forth? You can see this piece online and it's really fun to watch the progression. I mean, it's a crazy piece and lots of fun. Um, so Mar this is Marcel Duchamp the to the left with his brothers. Now they are both artists as well. It's appropriate for us to end our lecture with Marcel Duchamp because he would be very proud of the chaos he had spawned. Marcel, um, we, we just can't discuss modern art without him and his quirkiness. You know, we, uh, and I know you're familiar with this, you know, and he, in 1917, he presented the fountain to an exhibition. And of course he was denied. Um, this was the first conceptual art piece, mind over eye. Well, obviously, you, you look, at, look at a urinal and you have to decide that it's an art piece. And Duchamp said that it was an art piece because it was signed and presented as art. So art, because the artist says, and who is to say it's not? He quit art in 1921 to play chess, or so the world thought. And he, he, he died many years later. But Deschamps had one more trick up his sleeve. And that was when he died, it was revealed for the first time that he'd actually been working on a piece in secret. Now you view the piece through this, this hole in the door. You view the piece through a peephole. And this is what you see. And there has been lots written on this. So when, and, 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 and so we come to the end of our journey today. And let's just ask ourselves one more time about this conceptual art, how to evaluate it, what is art? There was a time when it was about beauty Greek statues, landscapes today, it amazes, it stuns, it awakens, it takes your breath away, it disgusts, it irks, it brings tears and laughter, and it broadens our thinking whether we like it or not. So how do you evaluate a piece of art? We're looking again at the John Baldessari, one of his pieces, 
So is, is art good or is it just all outlandish? Psychologists say that art has the greatest um, impact when it makes the thinking part of the brain talk to the feeling part. So here are some tips. Okay. When you look at a piece of art, your gut tells you something. Listen to your instinct, feel it in your bones. Does a piece of art not get old to you? Do you enjoy looking at it again and again and again? Do you find it amusing? Is there something there for you? Do you find it brave? Or maybe it's eye-opening for you in some way. Do you want to take this piece home? Would you take this piece home? And would it always feel like something new and wonderful to you? Or does it go dead after you have looked at it for a while? So these are the things about art. Ask yourself, maybe. So love it, hate it, but be involved. It'll make you feel really good. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I just want to also remind you that on February 9th, same time, 1030 through Seb Arts, we're going to look at Robert Rauschenberg and Jasper Johns. So I'm going to stop screen sharing now to see, are you still all with me? <laughs> did, you, did you bail? <laughs> and, and, do you have, and do you have any questions? Just unmute yourselves and ask a question. Linda, I have a question about, um, let me get his name here, Barnett Newman's piece with the, where you described the zip. I was yeah. curious about the title. It looks like a date. It's O-N-E-M-E-N-T, ornament, comma, one, yeah, comma. Yes, that's a, that, that is a Jewish term. And um, I can't, I'm, I'm trying to remember exactly what Let it means, see. but probably some of Spell you. it again. Yeah. One oh. month. He calls it one month. Oh. And um, as I said, it's a Jewish term. And um, I'm kind of forgetting exactly uh, the background on that. But uh, you, can look, you can look it up. And okay. um, yeah. So sorry, I can't give you more information on it. But that's okay. what it is. Anybody else? So what'd you think about this art? So Linda, this is Brooke. Yes, Brooke. Um, in the beginning, when you started out, and I don't remember all the artists' names, but some of those things look like photographs and not like, um, you know, uh, oil or, or acrylic or something. And uh, were they photographs or were they just so lifelike that they look like photographs? Well, I'm not sure which one you're referring to. I didn't show very many photographs. It's okay, so mo most of it is, of course, it's photos of the artwork, but but it but, but it is actual artwork. Okay, so let's look. I don't know who the artist is. The one with the two two people with their faces blocked out, and then yeah, that's a that's a piece that's a piece of artwork that's painted. And what's it painted with? Uh, probably oil. Could be acrylic. Okay. See, it, it just looked like photographs to me. That's why I yeah, asked. Yeah. 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 I totally understand okay. that kind of, that kind of does look like a photograph. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I can't stand any of this stuff, but I love, <laughs> I love your explaining it and, you know, why there's, I just totally agree that why it's accepted so often it's status symbols and just, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, anyhow, well, I think I, I'm think, involved. I hate it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think that I, I love your honesty. And you know what, what it is, is it when you spend a lot of time in one particular um, type of art, you will find yourself and you will find yourself sort of beginning eventually to yearn for something a little different, maybe a little more. And this is what happens to artists. Not only that, but they're also responding to the times. When we have times that change and, and, and we have wars and things like this, the artists are responding to those emotional, those emotional kinds of things. So that's why, you know, we, we, we eventually had art move away from things that were just beautiful because uh, the, the world became, had a lot of 
parts to it that weren't just beautiful. And art represents uh, everything today. So, yes, uh, Kathy. Oh, I can see. Kathy, I'm, I'm sorry, Natalie. Hi, um, I just wanted to point out uh, that along with the influences that you're um, talking about, <clears throat> Sachi, who gave Damien Hurst his big break, was the leader in the advertising industry, both in the United States and in Great Britain, which means all over Europe. So, you know, he got his start in advertising, he got a big stake, right. and that's how money is made today in the art world. And so we have to like keep taking a look at that. That's my feeling. You no, know, Natalie, you're absolutely 100% right about that. He and his brother had, had an advertising firm um, and he began to collect art. Uh, he did donate his art. Uh, uh, he, he had this huge museum and it's the Saatchi Museum, which you can go to. He donated that all to Britain. And of course, he married the famous uh, British cook. Uh, um, oh gosh, I, what her name uh, is uh, 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 Nutella or somebody like that. And, uh, you know, so they, they were the darling of the art world and got a divorce. But yeah, you're right. He started out that way. That's right. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, yes, Catherine. Uh, I let what is it? That's not Norm, right? But I let you speak first. It's Laura. <laughs> it's Laura and Norm. You sitting back there? <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, uh, I wanted to just say, Linda, thank you for a very fascinating lecture. And um, some of it I liked, but mostly my feeling was mostly of curiosity. I really wanted to know more, and I think if you do that in a lecture, that's that's really something else. Um, I wanted to say, I remember growing up, my father was an artist and he knew Barney Newman. Ah. And he was sort of made fun of him and was really upset that Barney Newman was getting all this money for all these paintings. And it's interesting at each time, there's sort of a shock at, uh, yeah, <laughs> at the next yeah. stage. And in the background, you can see not too well is one of my father's abstract expressionist yeah. paintings. <laughs> I know, Laura, your father did some wonderful work. Yes, Barney Newman was definitely part of that whole abstract expressionist movement, and he was a minimalist. And there was a lot of controversy around him and his concepts and ideas, and he wrote a lot about it and really kicked up a lot of dust. Anybody else? Uh, yes, Catherine. I wanted to congratulate you, Linda, because um, to approach such a subject, because I, I did not expect that many people today Truly, because I thought there would be no interest for it. And it shows that you have a good following for people who are interested to learn more. Yeah. I, I personally love conceptual art and I love performance art. And actually you kind of mixed both and they're actually a little bit different. Performance art is not there for conceptual art. I mean, they are conceptual, but it's considered a little bit different maybe. But, yeah. um, but you, you showed a lot of good examples where at least we can learn from. And uh, I think that's why sometimes I call and, and, and uh, it might be a little bit controversial what I'm going to say, but sometimes the art world is elitist because it's elitist not only because it promotes money, but also it promotes intellect. And uh, you know, a lot of this work is, is based on intellectual understanding of the work. Yeah. And uh, you need to have a whole lot of background because sometimes the, the history of this conceptual art has a lot of history based on, 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 on ancient history to get to the point where they are. Just like yeah. Picasso, Picasso could only do abstract work because he had he could paint like like he, he was a magician with his figurative work. Yeah. So it's, it's, it takes a lot of time, I think, to 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 really get into it. And some it is true. I understand some people don't like it. I, I totally understand that. But that's yeah. why I, I really want to thank you for putting that out there. And You're really welcome. It was it was really a lot of fun. And yes, I did slip in the happening. You know, um, there, there's just to understand the concept, yes, you know, yes. we kind of need to look at the broader scope, yes. you know, so um, because 
<clears throat> excuse me. Yeah. And I love it. I, I love it too. And, you know, Laura's saying uh, it makes her curious and that's a good thing. Yes, and, yes. Uh, you know, when you spend a lot of time in one area, you're going to find your tastes are changing, you, you know, and, and, you know, during, um, during uh, the, oh, the abstract expressionist period, the CIA actually promoted this abstract expressionist um, uh, art shows, uh, and they did it because there was so much uh, um, communism and um, leaning towards that during those that period, that they wanted to show modern art in America that the artists could paint whatever they wanted to paint, even though the government under the WPA was giving them money, where in other countries they had to paint what, what they were told what to paint. So, yeah. so the whole idea of modern art has always been fought against and always been thought to be elite to some degree yeah. because it is this intellectual um, thinking and, and, and breaking boundaries. And that is something that totalitarian governments uh, don't want to see. Anybody else? Um, I had, yeah, I wanted to show off this. I just made this little collage last week for, for 2022. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, and you can buy it for only $2,000 if you want. <laughs> Well, you're on your way, girl. Good for you. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying, I, I mean, frankly, uh, well, I love the show that your presentation, I learned so much and thank you. I took tons of notes and everything, but it's just um, as a leftist, uh, it's really hard for me to see that people are paying millions of dollars for something like that, some of that stuff. And meanwhile, people are starving in the streets, you know. It's I know it, it that, you know, it is hard. It is hard. Um, I, ha I have a whole show on high art and uh, and the reasons and so on. I'm not defending it, but I I think the reasons are that if if you are a um, uh, <coughs> making uh a billion dollars, or or you're making uh, twenty five million dollars. You see, it's it's not so much to spend uh, a million on a painting, mm. um, and and this is why it's happening because there's so much money, and it's also it's also happening because these people are forced to buy this work because they really can't um, buy the other work. It's not available, and it, and and for many of them, it's above what they can afford to do. So there, there are, I'm not defending it. Yeah. Maybe that money would be better to go someplace else. Okay, I'm not defending yeah, yeah, I'm just giving you I'm the glad, reason. Yeah, I'm glad that there's some, some living artists that are making money off their art. Yeah, right. So that, like I said, you know. It's, yeah, uh, I know, I know it's yeah. a lot. Yes, uh, Timothy, did you have a question? I just wanted to thank you uh, so much for this. It's so detailed and so much fun and really, um, I, I love being able to uh, get more information about why I like what I like. You know, I, I like this, but I don't quite know why, but what you're telling me explains or supports that opinion. So I really appreciate that. I learned a lot of new stuff. I didn't know about um, Hockney and his latest work with, with computer is so interesting. And thanks to SCA and Catherine for uh, doing these programs. I love being able to sit in my kitchen and learn about something so much fun. So, right. Thank you both. Okay, did you have a question? Is it, is it Anna? You're, you're muted, you're muted. Oh, okay, anybody else have a question? Uh, yes, um, uh, Laura? Yes, I just had one more. It's a quick comment. You mentioned something about the, uh, the CIA and wanting to present abstract expressionists and show American um, individualism or whatever and freedom. And I want to say that I know at least the Art Students League and the beginnings of some of the students there and abstract expressionists was actually communist left etc. And it may have evolved into that and they co-opted it, but that's just 
Well, it's from true. A personal it, 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 it's true. Like everybody else, there was a lot of that. And they were Trotskyites for the most part. And, yeah. you know, so when the whole business with uh, World War II and the Holocaust and then Stalin and all that uh, begin to wane, but uh, they were, they, they had thought, and, and, you know, that whole involvement with communism at that time for America, it wasn't that people wanted to overthrow the government and be communist. It was that with the wars and then the, and then you had the great depression and people just went through so much that they wondered if capitalism wasn't the answer. And so they, they weren't so much trying to overthrow it and make us communists, but they were looking for a better way. And when Russia had their great revolution, it looked like the workers were going to get you know, more to say, and that seemed maybe that's the best kind of system for us to have. And so there was a great thinking of that at that time about that and about what's the best system for, for um, what looked like at the time was a failing country. So um, that's what happened. Anybody else? Okay. So, uh, sorry, Linda, I have one more thing to say for any artist here. There will be an, uh, an upcoming exhibition called Still Life. So check the website, check, there will be, it's a deadline very, very soon, but everyone who has a still life, please enter it. Try to be in the show. Okay. okay. Thank you, Linda. I'm sorry. To, to All right. Me. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I hope to see you on the 9th. And we have one more after the 9th. We have one on March 9th, which is going to be museums and galleries and I think you'll find it very very interesting it's museums across the world and galleries and some of the galleries right here in Sonoma County so join me for that wonderful Thank bye. You, bye 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 this bye. is being this is being